Legends of the All Blacks has come to the home of a great New Zealand rugby legend, Sir Colin Meads. The player of the 20th century, he dominated New Zealand rugby through the 60s and 70s, winning worldwide fame and is now represented here in its statue in his hometown of Tikawiti. Well, Sir Colin, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us, but just if we can start with the early days of your career and growing up as a young fella in the King Country, what are your memories of those earliest years? Oh, just being a youngster roaming the hills and doing all the young, things that young boys did around Tikawiti and, you know, going to Saturday morning rugby and, and then just through school. I had an uncle who used to play for Wellington and uh, New Zealand Varsity and that sort of thing, but uh, and another one for Man Number Two. They were cousins actually. Oh, and, but um, yeah, that, not not the All Blacks. You know, it's something we dream of. But uh, always interested, and we used to follow them. And and uh, Mum and Dad, you know, used to get us up to listen to the game. Say they were in South Africa, put the scones out and the fire stoked up and. In those days, we had no electricity where we were, and used to have uh, radio batteries. Used to get the static, and Dad always knew where to hit the radio when it got static. He'd give it a wallop, and she'd come right again. But yeah, the All Blacks were always well; they were part of New Zealand, you know. Just but we were no different to the, all the other young fellows around. Now, I understand early on, Ron Briers was a mentor and a coach for you. Do you remember any specific advice or, or action that helped you realise your potential at that early stage? I, I was never big at school. I never really grew until I was sort of 15. And, and as a hooker and that sort of thing, and a little fella in the front row, it's, it's something I sort of grew into and liked and, and always wanted to be a f sort of hooker or front front row, but outgrew it. And uh, so you... But Ron Bryce was, you know, Good for King Country, he'd been in All Black uh, in 48 and uh, we sort of came through. He took the Roller Mills team, he took the primary school, or the secondary school team and King Country Juniors, so the only other teams we had from seniors. And so I was in all of those when he coached them on the way through and then got to King Country and he was coaching the King Country team. So if it was King Country, Ron Bryce was the coach. And did he help your understanding of the game or where you could actually go in rugby? Oh, yeah, and he made you... He, he was a great mentor and, uh, you know, he used to get you wound up before a game and uh, what it meant to be playing for King Country and, and playing against top teams and that sort of thing. So, yeah, he was, he was a good mentor and he was, you know, good for King Country because... He was, you know, could get through to players where a lot of other people wouldn't have. The trip you had to Ceylon with the, the New Zealand Colts was obviously a, a, an early boost for you. And I, a JJ Stewart apparently impressed on you the idea of running with the ball more. Um, how did that affect your future approach to the game? I don't know. When you first get into those sort of teams, I suppose you're shy and young and tall and awkward. And he told me at one training run, he said, it's like an electric shock, that ball. He said, when you, when you grab it, it gives you electric shock and, and you've got to go, he said. So I probably never stopped doing it after that. <laughs> <laughs> For all that, you weren't one of the players he nominated at the end of the tour as a likely All Black. I always remember that and I reminded him a few times in, later on. He, I think he named six players in that team who went to Sloan that thought would be, you know, future could be All Blacks. And, I wasn't one of them, but I did develop a lot in the next 12 months after that. So it was a good step in your career, taking that tour? Oh, hell yeah. And, you know, to uh, with fellows like Winneray and that sort of thing, and even though a lot of the top players were not available for it, like if you'd have represented the North Island, like the Terry Lenines and Pat Walshers and all them, they were young enough to go in it, but they'd represented big rugby and sort of through that put them out. Another important step in you in realising the ex extra elements required of a player at that level, I believe, was the 56 North-South game. And you got some early understanding from Ron Jarden about the variety of options and lineouts. Yeah, well, we in King Country never trained much, you know. We, we just used to play rugby. And because you couldn't get together, we might have two training runs in a whole year, you know, sort of thing. But And I'm down there and I'm playing... 
I used to play in the front of the line out for King Country sort of thing, or the middle of the line out. And here I am with Jack Finley at seven in the line out. And we're out of training and he said, you know, he's got all the team, and got the line outs. And the first three line outs, no matter where they are in the field, they're going to be thrown to me. And I've got to throw it to Ponty Reed off the top of the line out, you know. And, uh, hell, Steve. There I am with Tiny White and Evan McHugh and all these. Peter Burke was in the team, Don McIntosh. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and um, so Ron Jarden came to me and said, how do you like the ball thrown in? I'm, how do I like it thrown in? Or do you know, just, just throw her in. <laughs> It'll be right. And he said, oh, you want fast or slow? Then he could see that I was pretty naive on what... So he said, well, after training, oh, we'll have five or ten minutes together, play, you know, and we, he took me away and put me through my paces with the fast one, slow uh, lobs and all that sort of thing. And it was tremendous. That's fantastic. I mean, but uh, the, the good part about the game, the whole three, because Tiny White complained about it. He said, what if we're now in 25? And, Jack Finley had a funny way of, he had a pro, those big baggy shorts that the old Kiwis used to have, and he had a program in it, in his back pocket. And Tiny had questioned things, and he's got this day. He pulls out the program, he said, I know you're good, Tiny. Your photo's on the front of the paper, but you're going to do it my way. Oh, <laughs> here's my hero being bawled out by, you know, Jack Finley. And, but Tiny didn't want it thrown into me if, it, if we were in our own 25 or anything like that. But uh, we weren't, luckily, and uh, everything went perfect to plan. You've also mentioned some surprise that the thirst of knowledge, I believe, from your King Country teammates when you got back. A lot of them were older than you, but they wanted to know more about what you'd experienced and how they could improve. Yeah, well, you go to, we went to a training run, you know, a couple of weeks later, and uh, what did you learn? What, what do you learn? where the hooker puts his feet and what, you know, this sort of stuff. It was all new to me, but, you know, they were, we were so inexperienced that they wanted to know any little thing that had helped, you know, one another. And did that continue right through your career, passing on that? Oh, much? well, it did, you know, sort of because cause I was so young and, you know, there were some old, nasty, nasty old, old, old King Country players in there. Yeah, and they were listening to me, telling me, you know, telling them what we should do, and I thought mm, it's pretty good. This. <laughs> How did that help your confidence? Oh well, it, it gives you that confidence to speak in front of them, yeah. and you know, to speak about uh, rugby and what we should, where we should be going, and that sort of thing. Just after that, of course, you get selected for your first All Blacks tour to Australia. Well, yeah. See, '56, I was lucky. I played through all the trials. I, you know, in 56 it was beat the Springboks or else, you know, it was the end of New Zealand rugby if we don't win. And, and I can always remember, and I played in just about all the trials. They, they had trials here, trials there, trials in Morrinsville, trial. And uh, you got to Wellington, played the North-South game. Then they had uh, New Zealand played the rest. And I'm sitting in there, and Bob Duff was a reserve for it. I'm sitting there with Bob Duff, and you know, thought of hell, Keith, you know, what, what's going on in my world? But, and you, um, you know, you, and then they had the New Zealand played the North Island back at New Plymouth, and I had a reasonably good game there. And you think to yourself, well, I'm sure I played better than that other fella, but uh, I didn't, and years later, or you know, some time later in my career with Jack Sullivan, who was a, he was a, one of the selectors then, he wasn't the coach or anything, but he was coach later on and manager of the teams and that, and chairman of New Zealand. Years later he told me, no matter how well you played, we were never going to pick you. And I thought, oh, what the bloody... <laughs> I didn't say that, but you think, what the hell, am I trying to burst my guts out for you if you're not going to pick me? Did he give you an explanation why? Was it just oh, because just you were so young? young? He's just too young. He said, oh, no, we weren't going to throw you to those springbok forwards. But how much did that benefit you in terms of, you know, when you look back at it? The... Oh, well, I think it benefited me in the sense that come 57, the likes of myself and Winneray and Rex Pickering and Axe Soper and... A lot of the other ones had retired and, uh, you know, it was 
the openings were there for us, put it that way, to step into those shoes. The Australian and New Zealand teams file out onto the paddock at the Sydney Cricket Ground before a crowd of 28,000 rugby followers. A bad pass from Cox has Tooth in trouble, and the all-black forwards, Meads, McIntosh and Burke, are there to make things difficult. What did you take from your first experience on an all-black tour? Just what it means, that all-black jersey. Yeah. Oh, I used to get, uh, or probably more so that in later years, the value it people put on the All Black jerseys. The odd All Black used to go and train in it, you know, wash them and train in All Black. I would never train in an All Black jersey if, if you were paid to, you know, sort of thing. You just didn't do it. You always had your own training gear. You used to stink like hell, not like the modern ones where they have a new set every training room. Yeah. But, uh, I, you know, that used to, I think the All Black jersey was sacred and something you kept uh, and you only put it on when you're going to war. That tour was a prelude to Australia coming back in 58 and then onset of the Lions in 59. What are your memories of those particular years and campaigns? Rex Pickering and Peter Jones played the first test at Dunedin and I was just sat on the sideline. You know, you didn't strip or anything and, and uh, you could see what was wrong at the back of the They were just pouring through our line out. And, and uh, you know, I, I said, that's what's going to happen before the game. I said to Jack Sullivan, they just... You know, if you throw any ball off the top of the line, you're going to get murdered. You go. And it's what, what sort of happened. And so after that was a victory, 18, 16, was 17, it? Yep. 18, 17, uh, they, they brought in three new, three new loose forwards like myself and Tremaine and Dick Conway. Just going back a wee bit there, you said that you didn't even strip for the training before the test, is that right? I stripped for the training, but not for the game. Oh, not for the game, yep. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, of course, Tremaine coming in there, that was the start of a great liaison between the two of you. Yeah, we'd become great mates, and because then uh, we would, uh, you know, we'd been to Japan in 58, and uh, we were locks. <laughs> him and I were the locks on the Japan tour and along with Kevin Barry and we all ended up as loose forwards in you know, the next year or so and I went on to become a lock. And so, so when did you actually feel that lock was your position? Oh well it's when they put me there. Like, <laughs> you always sort of wanted to play, uh, you know, I was always preferred a, a loose forward but you know you've got to go where you put and then you grew into it. I grew into being a lock and because I played lock, you know, a bit in 51 test in 59 when Nev McEwen got mumps and then uh, in 60 I played it one test, two tests at lock I think. And so I was always there but whether I was number eight or lock or side row didn't worry me. What were the important lessons in locking? Oh, well, one, it was so different now, but you, you, the important lesson was to, our scrum, once you got, you had to get there quick. And once our front rows were there, the, the last person to the scrum had to be a prop, like, so once the two front rows were there, you were straight in. You know, I still can't understand why the referee's got to tell you when to go down. Yeah. Everybody nowadays talks about the 71 team, but the 59 Lions were also a charismatic side, weren't they? Oh, hell yeah, and, and a great side, but uh, rugby was so different then. They never had really coaching much, and they just went out and played, picked teams and played, and a couple of managers. And, but, uh, you know, with the uh, O'Reilly's and, uh, you know, Bev Rusman, and uh, I'm trying to think of the little halfback, cheeky little bugger, he was bloody brilliant. Mulligan. You know, he came out, it wasn't it? The it was the Englishman. Jeeps. Jeeps, yeah. He was a good player, good, they were good guys, but they were characters socially too, you know. You'd often have a bun fight at the dinner. I heard, but I was going to ask you about the bun <laughs> fight in Dunedin <laughs> after the 1817. It all was okay until they start hitting the top table, so. <laughs> mm. The trip to South Africa, of course, you mentioned that you still weren't a regular lock at that stage. But how, how tough was that? Is it? an early experience because you were taken out of a real environment in New Zealand to a controversial environment in South Africa. 
Oh, yeah, but it was because they had big forwards too, you know, and you, you'd be exhausted after a game, you know, you'd put everything into it and hard tracks, you know, there was no slipping over in scrums or anything. You, you either went forward or backwards and it was, if you went backwards, it was your fault, sort of thing. Did you enjoy the dry weather play, the dry grounds? Oh, yeah, I loved it. Yep. Yeah. It suited your style of play down to down to the ground. Oh well, I I enjoyed running with the ball. You know, a lot of before my time, a lot of the locks never if they touched the ball apart from lineouts. They they had a good game. You know, they, I used to love to get it and go for a bit of a jog around somewhere. <laughs> A capacity crowd of 75,000 awaits the start of the first test of the 1960 series between the All Blacks and the Springboks. The forwards hook from a set scrum, Lockyer to Oxley, and Tilm slips into the back line, breaks through, and then lets out a pass to Kirkpatrick. Henny Fitzale has it. There's an overlap. He runs round Colton and touches down under the posts. In terms of some of the players you played against in that tour, I, I take it there'll be some well-known players that you rated as, as opponents in that time? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, well, all the way through. You know, first in that 60 was because I played against him in 56 was Klassen. Yeah, uh -huh. Klassen. Yeah. He was a great player and dear old bugger, but he was he was hard to get the ball off. And no matter what you did to him, he still kept going for the ball. You sort of couldn't put him off. And, and I learned a lot from just playing against him. Did you strike the trouble in 60 with the referees that you did in 1970? Um, probably we did, but you know, I wasn't in a, a leading role in the All Blacks as much as I was then. But you always do over there, and in there, because you've got their referees. And the trouble is, they, they're so good to you in the provincial games because they're after the test matches, and then you, you pick them for a test match, and Danny Craven has a talk to them, and they become different referees. Yeah. Of course, that was Don Clark's tour in a lot of ways too, wasn't it? He made a huge impact on that tour with his goal kicking. With the boot, yeah. Yeah. What particular memories of his, some of his feats? Well, he, I think he drop kicked a bowl, a left foot goal, and you need to be careful. I don't know whether it was against Newlands or the second test at Cape Town, and he had Kel Tremaine's left boot on because he'd only arrived at the ground with one boot. <laughs> And Tremaine had a spare pair in his bag, and it was one of those lightweights, but Don yeah, he was a right footer, so he kicked with the other one. But he dropped kicked the skull with his bloody left foot. But oh, he was colossal, you know. He, he give it to me, oh. He, he'd have been kicking goals these days from 70 yards. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> It's over to Bloemfontein, where the All Blacks run out onto the field for the important third rugby test match against South Africa. And of course the most significant memory of his goal kicking is that third test to get the 11 all draw when he kicked that conversion. Don Clark takes it. It's over, and there is the final whistle. South Africa have to be satisfied with a draw after looking certain winners. Oh well, with with his brother being the line umpire, the flag was up before he kicked the bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we always say, but it's not quite right. The French and New Zealand teams file out for the first rugby test in the long-awaited 1961 series. And of course, the next year, France came out here for the first time. That must have been an interesting experience because you didn't quite know what you were in for. A long pass to Al Bouladejo, and Monsieur Drop himself sends a beautiful drop kick over between the posts. Well, you see, that's why rugby was so good in our days. Now they they go on a tour, but they know exactly how this fella plays because of videos and television and all that. We had none of that. You didn't didn't know any of, didn't know any of the players. You just oh, you're marking some Ali Sester, or you're marking some. You know, it didn't mean a thing to you until you played against. So that would have required a pretty quick analysis of what was going on and how to, how to deal well, with it. Well, yeah, and you've got to, that's where you've got a captain, good captain comes in and you've got to work out, you know, like I could, later on I often used to be able to say, because I'd play at three and Ken Gray at two, that's in my later career, 
I could say to Winneray or the Hall, don't play me, play Ken Gray because they're, they're sitting on me a bit. And, you know, that's the way it should be. But other locks and that used to get all say, God, they only played me in the line out three times or four times. I don't give, with me, I didn't give a bug as long as we got the ball, you know, sort of thing. And I used to say, I'll concentrate on their ball and see what I can get of theirs. What a win. A near cyclone hits New Zealand on the day of the second test and at Wellington's Athletic Park the crowds are buffeted and rocked by the savage southerly. In terms of the, that French series, I suppose the one that everybody talks about is Wellington. I mean, what were your memories of that hurricane that blew through? Well, it was, it was unreal because you didn't know until half past 12 whether we were playing or not. And uh, then you go down and then you think, well, you know, it's just a mystery what's going to happen, you know, sort of thing. You can't say, well, well, kick it down the end and sit there because you kick the bloody thing dead. And, uh, you know, those sort of things. So, but it was, it was, I enjoyed that, you know, that whole go. The French, I think we won, what did we win? Five, five, three? Five, three, yeah. Through the Don Clark conversion. Now, how he converted that, because Don was a showman too, of course. And, it, Tremaine had scored it fairly wide out and Don kicked the ball straight across the field and it blew between the posts. They hook back to Lacaz for a clearing kick, but Tremaine charges it down. He scored, New Zealand have drawn level 3 all. Clark kicks and it's over. New Zealand 5, France 3. He said he planned it. I, I, Planned at me, bloody ass. <laughs> you know, it was just a fluke. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there were great memories, and socially, you'd have thought the French won. They, you know, they were thrilled with the game, and we, I can never remember, we were rooming, you had different rooms, but I was rooming with John Graham and Neil Wolfe, three of us to a room. We, somehow you do silly things, you know, after games, and we sort of got to her back to our, our room after having a fair few after match function beers and then, you know, off to a dinner because we always went to a dinner. And so we'd said to one another, oh, well, we'll stick together tonight, us three, you know, we're good, in good roommates, so we'll finish the test off, stick together. So, you know, that's how it's planned. So, well, the French were in hilarious form. They were a la mouche, a la, and phew, the noise that was coming, so we joined in. And, you know, we're not used to drinking spirits and the things they were drinking, sort of thing. And I'll never forget it. We got to, got to this dinner, three All Blacks and three Frenchmen, and bloody, you know, we were with this uh, wine and God knows what. And then out comes this Tauira soup. He got a bottle of red wine, put the red wine in the soup, all of us, and picks the plate up. That was the end of Wolfie. He's gone. <laughs> Well, John Graham got to the main course, and he was gone. And I thought, hmm, they're not going to not going to beat me, you bastards. Well, there was noise and row, and we'd come back from South Africa, and a fellow Doug Hamilton was complaining to the Jack Sullivan, "You should be able to keep these fellows under control. They're too noisy, and we're telling him to shut up." <laughs> it was terribly wrong of a sin. And anyway, you they were just about going to have a fight over us, you know, sort of thing. Well, then, oh, you know, I could feel I wasn't well, and Winneray got hold of me, and thank God the taxis had windows. I could. <laughs> well, we got back to our room. What a bloody mess in this room! And but you know, it was a start of great friendships with the French, and I got on well with them. Yeah. Of course, just after that is the is the big tour to Europe. You, you know, first major tour over there for you. Um, it's a long way from Tikuiti, isn't it? What the sights of the sights of those cities? Oh, it is. But you you're there as an All Black, and you you see what you have to see. But I wasn't a great tourist as, as a sightseeing tourist. I, I train hard and often have a sleep after lunch. And what was the actual? You know, you're five months or four or five months away from home, and it's constant, constant rugby. I mean, how did you cope with that? Was there time for 
let off a bit of steam? Or oh, how did you, how you let off steam on Sundays. And, uh, you know, we, we had our social times and life was different. After every game you had a t uh, dinner, you know, and people used to get upset with dinners. I didn't, I used to think they were bloody marvellous because you get your, whoever you played against if you played or the reserves and you, you mix with them. You, uh, like I've been to tests in the last few years or four or five years ago and one team's here, the other team's sitting all over the, not together. And I thought, what the bloody hell is this all about? You know, want to get an order, autograph? They get up from here, go way over there, get an autograph. So I, I just wonder where it's gone. But in our days, you used to mix freely with the opposition and, and always have a drink and, you know, and, and just social occasion, you know. And, it's players, uh, you appreciate, people used to think you had to drink to be an All Black, you know, and you didn't. You know, fellas like Sid going would be doing the same thing as we were, you know, with their other mate halfback or that sort of thing. A great tourist and, you know, you'd, you'd get called Juicy Boy, but, uh, you know, like, uh, just, uh, it was, it was a good occasion, some of those dinners, I thought, and you got to know your opposition. How was it after the Newport game early on and the, the disappointing oh, loss? Well, she was pretty. It wasn't wasn't a nice place to be an All Black at the time. Next morning is the muddiest ground and the dirtiest, shittiest ground you got in Wales. That's where we're going to train. I don't know where it was, and they took us out there in the mud and shit and slush and. and uh, they put us through the hoops, Neil McPhail put us through the hoops there. We all got a bloody message. And in many ways it was the makings of the tour because we'd lost it, been beaten, and we didn't have to carry the mantle of unbeaten team, but it was good for the side. But, you know, one or two players got hurt by it, but uh, it was uh, brought us together and uh, we, from there on, had another good win. Straw, left overnight to protect against frost, is cleared from the playing area of Cardiff Arms Park. A Welsh supporter tries to plant a leak on the goalposts and the sun shines brightly. The first Welshman is brought to ground. The old foe, Wales, were probably the test you most wanted to win, I would imagine. Oh, hell yeah. And, like, it was so... To, to go to Cardiff Arms Park... <coughs> When we were there in 63, we'd never won at Cardiff Arms Park since 1905 or 04 or whenever, because they didn't play there in 24. No. It wasn't available, you know, to play on. And so the 35 team, 53, lost all their games at Cardiff Arms Park. And we were getting telegrams, take no prisoners, and the manager would be reading You'd think we are going to war, you're, you're like it was, going to war. 6-0, I think, the score. Yeah, but we, we thought we'd won by 50 points. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was enough. That was what mattered. Well, it was, you know, once again, a hard game because they were trying to live up to the tradition of Cardiff. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't very good rugby to watch. It was bloody terrible if you really sat down and watched it. Yeah, I, I believe Ken Gray had a big game that day. Well, Ken Gray had a lot of big games. You know, he was... He was one of the stalwarts of our team in 63. And he had had a bit of strum up about putting on some, a bit of weight. And, and old Durol Ken Gray, he got really stuck in. They had picked a fellow, Brian Thomas, I'm sure it was Brian Thomas, had prop, and it was a normal lock, but just to get an extra big man in there. Well, Ken Gray put this poor bugger through the hoops. <laughs> I can remember we had a 25-yard scrum, you know, from something they'd done at the so scrum on the 25. We started pushing them, and Tremaine's just sitting on the side saying, keep it going, keep it going. He's waiting for us to bloody pounce on <laughs> the ball. But, um, <coughs> yeah, Ken Gray was a great player. He, I rated him the strongest man I ever put a shoulder, I ever put a shoulder on. 
And of course, the, the great highlight at the end of the tour was the Barbarians game. I mean, that must have been a marvellous occasion. And you had this great relationship with Wilson Winneray, and it must have been great to just experience that with him. Oh, well, that was a great game for us. And Winneray, the try Winneray got, you know, I was saying earlier that uh, he, he tonged me up for not passing the ball to him. And uh, I had him one side of me, Ralph Colton, the other side of me, and this little fella between me and the line. The little bugger tipped me over. And I wasn't the most popular fella in the team at the time. And uh, they used to give me a fair bit of stick about that. And I can remember saying to Winneray, walking back from that barbarian try that he got, and you called me a greedy bastard. <laughs> Because he's old me, the dummy. Yeah. And the, in the meantime, the crowd's singing for he's a jolly good fellow. Yeah. So it was a sort of a sign of the esteem they held him yeah. Oh, yeah, he was a popular man. Great captain. He wasn't a big man, so what made him such an important part of the front row? Well, he, he was clever, you know, real clever, and he worked out. And he was strong, you know, very strong. But... Uh, he get the ball in quick and, you know, it was a different game in the scrums. There wasn't the pressure on it as nowadays. The hookers used to hook. <laughs> nowadays there's no such bloody thing. You know. And uh, will he get away? Some of them used to have him on a few bit, but mostly he got away with it. He was a bloody good player. And he took the year off in 64, but 64 wasn't a, didn't end in the nicest possible way with that heavy loss to Australia at Athletic Park. Yeah, well, then I played number eight. I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> yeah, that was my last effort as a loose forward. And uh, I think Will Winneray sent me a telegram after that one too because he, he'd played a game at north, north of Scotland up in Aberdeen. And a uh, fellow, Ronnie Glasgow, scored three tries from their side. Winneray played number eight for us and we gave him hell. So I got a nice telegram back again. <laughs> what was the problem that day? Was it just the end of a very long period for the team? Oh, I don't know. No, we didn't play well, and uh, I think they were they were having trouble selection-wise getting the right team, and uh, the selectors uh, as a group. I remember. I think they had five selectors that year, and it was it wasn't a happy selection panel put it that way yeah and of course the next year hosting the Springboks, and you you get the chance to play them in well the then they brought it back to three selectors and fred fred and uh neil mcphail and uh, tussock from down south did um fred's impact start at that stage or was it didn't it really oh, it was hit him starting in? it was starting yeah they um they were both kiwis together and kiwis but, it's McPhail and, and Fred, yeah. And Fred used to get McPhail on his side about running the ball, you know, sort of thing. But, but I suppose it really started the next year when Fred got the range. And, yeah. But we knew it was sort of coming because a lot of the Auckland boys were in the team and that had Fred. And, and I never forget McPhail couldn't get to our first training run in Auckland for the last test. Fred took it. And when I kept us schooled up, he'd send the forwards away over there. And, Come on, we'd better look as if we're doing something because there's one old bugger over there will be here shortly. <laughs> you know, sort of thing. So they knew and we knew it was coming. An estimated 66,000 enthusiasts cheer the All Blacks in the Springboks as they take the field at Auckland's Eden Park for the last test in 1965. It's Lahore racing forward. As Barnard seizes him, he passes to Rami. The fast running centre eludes both Engelbrecht and De Villiers to make an overlap. Out to Smith, and he goes in for his second try. You did run the ball a bit in that fourth test, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, well, we. And I think we were allowed to a bit too, you know, because Winner I was always one to run the ball where we could. Yeah. Yeah. I understand going back to the third test in that series, when you're up 16 5 at, at half time, there was a bit of a discussion about whether you should perhaps give it a bit of air in the second half. Well, there was, and uh, I don't know just where it sort of came from, but uh, I think they thought us forwards were becoming a bit greedy and wanted too much ball or something, and and it we loosened up, put it that way, and uh, I can remember Johnny Gainsford got two tries, and 
and uh, you know Dick Conway got the blame for that, and you know we were, like we were, we were at six and sevens. Gainsford was one of the better backs you faced in your career. One of the greats here, along with a couple of Frenchmen. Yeah. What was what was those Gainsford's qualities? What made him special? Oh, he was big and strong, and uh, uh, could visualise the game, you know, sort of thing where to go, and had a side step on him that beat most people. And you'd had a bit to do with him socially, and there's a bit of mud thrown and uh, literally in Carisbrook in the first. Uh, second well, it all happened. Five of us went back there in early '64 to uh, South African 75th Jubilee, I think it was. And we were told by the New Zealand Rugby, it was in sort of March, I think, pretty early, you know, March, April, and we were told by the New Zealand Rugby, and you look, you have a good time, it's not a, nothing on this trip. So we got over there, but we were there a week before anyone else. Five full backs. Pat Walsh was there not to play, and so for Ralph Love went, you know, there was the Maori connection and all those things, and we were given cars because uh, when I was with the breweries then, and he had a car and a boot full of beer. We used to go after in trips. Ah, yeah, it was a. And then a couple of days before the, when all the other players arrived, it was, was hard on the South Africans because they had to pick a team straight after it to play against whoever they were South Africa were playing. And you know they were all keen to show their mettle in front of, and thrown in amongst all us buggers misbehaving. And well, you know, but we got to know them really well. And uh, in the first game we had, we only had the three games. First game we had, they had the world forwards with the South African backs and vice versa. Well, we flipped the ball off the top and Darwin de Villiers, see what you can make of that one. <laughs> and that, but their backs were good, you see. And John, that's when we learned that about Johnny Gainsford being so good. And you know, you got to know them, Johnny Gainsford and Lionel Wilson and and Hopkirk and all those guys, they were good fellas. Yeah. And the uh, second game was all mixed up and it was a shambles. And so for the third game, they went back to how it was for the first one. And in all that time in connection with South Africa, did you get a sense of the, the apartheid issue? Were you conscious of it or were you sort of divorced from we, it? You're sort of divorced from it pretty much, but when you're there as an all black, you know, they're always down one end of the field and cheap ends, you know, sort of thing. We used to have a policy, like, you know, depending, but the conditions were always pretty good. We'd play towards the blacks, because they used to cheer like hell for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, in places like Cape Town, you used to be entertained by the coloureds, and, you know, so you, you did get, you knew it was there, and it was something that was due to blow, you know, sort of thing, somewhere in life it was going to. Yeah. And did you have a particular stance on it at all? Or? No, I just took a rugby stance and said, look, we're here to play rugby and not interfere with politics and used the same old catchphrase, rugby and politics shouldn't mix. And yeah. How do you look at it now when you look back at what's happened? Oh, if you went to South Africa now as an individual on your own, you'd say, well, this is tragic what's happened because it's not a safe country anymore and some of the things that have happened are tragic but it is right what's happened but uh, it's it's poor country it's poverty everywhere and they've just spread the poverty around more it's not just with the blacks it's with the whites it's with everyone yeah 1966 Fred takes the reins I believe you had a, an early interesting association with Fred well, you, you sort of didn't, you knew him, but you didn't know him, you know, sort of thing. And uh, you knew the old bugger was, times could be grumpy and that sort of thing. And, and there was King Country's first game of the year and we were playing Thames Valley. He came out in the Herald that morning saying uh, the All Black forwards are getting soft. No. So that bloody hurt me a bit, you know, sort of thing. And I thought, well, bugger. 
and he come to the game. He was there watching us. And Fred was the sort of guy you didn't hurt any of his boys. And like he'd, he'd had the shield like two years before this. And Kevin Barry was one of his boys, you know, he was in Tim, but he was now playing for Tim Shirley. And we used to call him Ned, you know. And Ned and I knew one another. We'd been on these trips together here, there. And he, I used to, I was pushing one, uh, he pushed me. Uh, I said to Ned, don't do it, because you know what's going to happen. You know, Ned, please, don't do it. And uh, the buggy, so he, he didn't think I'd do it, you see. So I thought, oh, well, I'll wait till I'm right in front of Fred and I'm. <laughs> well, Fred was waiting for me after the game and give me a bloody tongue up if I ever see you doing that to some of my boys. And I said, well, I thought, I, I said to him, well, I just read in the bloody paper this morning that we're getting soft. I thought I'd show you we're, we're not bloody soft. Oh, it's not you we're talking about getting soft. We're trying to get Tremaine going. <laughs> well, for Christ's sake, go and tell him, don't. You know, that's how it sort of went. Then. Yeah. We, we didn't speak to one another too friendly for a while. What did he bring to the team that led to that sort of revolution at this stage? Because the laws well, changed. He, he brought... Yeah, the confidence to get the ball further, you know, and we had McRae who was a great strong, McRae had to make decisions if it goes, doesn't go any further or it does and, you know, 90% of the time, but if it doesn't go, you knew it wasn't going to go past McRae if we were, I think, the opposition's up on us and all. So you could zone in on a maul or ruck there, but if it went past McRae, you had to, you had to be over by the bloody winger somewhere and bloody quick, not like nowadays out in the back line. Mike campbell Lamerton, team captain of the Lions, leads the British Isles 15 out for a third test against New Zealand. Here are New Zealand's famous line-out forwards in action, strong, skillful, strategic. Colin Mead sends it back to Nathan, a long pass out to McRae. McRae kicks ahead, Wilson and Bebb try to gather it in. And now Wakanathan's there to scoop up the loose ball and dive over for a spectacular drive. During that Lions series, you know, the one you won 4 0 in 66, did you get a sense of what was to come even more so in 67 on the tour of Britain? Oh, hell yeah, you know, and uh, you knew once you're touring and living with him, you'd get more, more daily contact, you know, regular and hard runs because he was fitness guy too, you know, he used to run that. And I used to love that side of it. It helped your game? Oh yeah, I used to love the running, fitness wise, I used because we did a lot of it here, running. And, and um, Fred, had, some of the backs used to hate Fred's training runs. Because he, you know, I can remember Bill Davis saying, well, might be right for those bloody forwards, but it's no good for us backs, we want short, sharp stuff. Yeah. In terms of the of the '67 tour, I mean, it's it's been regarded now, and I see there's a book just out called "The yeah. Team That Changed Rugby Forever." Do you, did did it make that bigger change? Well, you don't know it at the time, yeah. But I, I think looking back, it did. Yeah. But it made a change for the opposition too. Like, like they got better, and, and uh, we we went through a lean period after '72. Whereas if Fred had stayed on, I don't know, Fred had a bee in his bonnet that he was going to get the sack. And so pulled out before we went to South Africa in 70. If Fred had gone, we'd have won that series. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Fred was adamant he was going to get him and Jack Sullivan didn't get on and he was going to get the boot. He had a great ally, though, in the 67 tour and Charlie Saxton, didn't he? Oh, well. Charlie was Fred's boss, you see, in the army, everywhere. The only one, the man that could control Fred when he was, was Charlie. Yeah. Because we went on a tour to 68 to Australia, and Fred was always in a lot of trouble. And I, the other manager used to come and get me or Tremaine or somebody to go and get Fred out of it. Well, what were Charlie Saxon's qualities as a manager? Oh, a little man, strong. Uh, very forthright and very straight up honest as the days long and and you know, real courageous little man. Yeah. 
He came up with, a, I believe, a, a key tactic that helped you beat France on that trip, which was pretty important as well, it turned out. You know, but that was Charlie and in, in the thinking, you see, because this was the night before the test. We hadn't practiced it or anything. Every line out, apart from the hooker, he's going to stand on the five-yard mark, is going back 15 yards. We all looked at one another, what the shit's he talking about? And a lot of, so we sat down and worked out all what we are going to do. And, no line-out calls, just throw it to Sam Storm in the middle line, like, as long as we all have a go at it. But, but if Sam, if Sam's the target, you know, because he's so far back, yeah. a bit awkward to get it there all the time. And so uh, Sam had a field day too, but it shocked. The, the French didn't have a, what the hell's going on here? They were dumbfounded, they're looking at one another, you're arguing and started yakking and talking. And I thought, shit, we've got these silly bastards. So it was a great tactic, and it was a it was a key test match too, wasn't it? Because oh, quite a tough, I know Brian yeah. Brian Lahore has talked about it being the toughest oh, yeah. he ever played. It's one of them. Well, that's how I would got my head cut open. I never, you know, I always sort of blame Villa Pru, not Villa Pru. Uh, Doga, Ben Varduga for it, and because Fred, Fred, that was Fred's fault too. You know, Fred used to lead you into things because we had four games in France. Might have been five, no, four, I think, yeah, four games. And it wasn't, every team was selected by the French selectors. And uh, it'd be Southwest France or it'd be, the, you know. Well, every game and every paper had Duga in it. Bloody, for this big, ugly bastard. I tell stories about being the ugliest man I've ever played against, but, you know, and all those sort of stories I tell. He, you know, and it, he was a reserve for the first game. And Fred had come up to you, all stripped off, you'd had your game, you'd won and all that. Sort of, he'd come up, Fred had come up, he'd give you a whack in the ribs, you know, not, not a light one either. He'd just, can you handle that? And you know, what, 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 what's your problem? Can you handle that? Well, that was Duga, you see, can I handle it? And I thought, right. So what do you say? You're trying to think to yourself. If you say yes, I can, you'd be a scotting bastard. If you say no, you can't. You gutless bugger. You know, you, you had to. So you had to say to him, just get, get him on the field. We'll find out how good he is. Well, do you know, for the whole three games before the test, two girls were reserved, and I'm getting all this treatment. I got to the stage I'm having bloody nightmares about this big ugly bastard. Well, during the game. It, you know, we'd been going 30, 40 minutes. I don't know, it was just before half time, I think. Not sure on that, but we, I did a willy away and, you know, got bloody tripped up and fell over and whack in the back of my head. All I could think of was Duga, you dirty bastard. You know, and f which was wrong, you know, but I didn't care about any, well, they took me to the sideline and, you know, bandage and um, I'm telling them hurry up get on with it get get it I'm gonna get back I'm gonna kill this bath that's how I was talking well I went back there and I tried to pull Hugo I belted shit out of him Kirky tells a story that I attacked every French forward it's all bullshit but and I was really wild over the day. poor Dugo he got a broken bloody nose Big black eye out here, and I knocked a tooth out, and I cut my hand. I was having a shit of a day, and he, uh, you know, and uh, I never got him off the field. That was my ambition was to get him off the field, and never got him off. So, so you bloody wolf! After the game, you're pissed off, you know, you're bloody upset. And, if Duga's over there, I'm over here. I don't want to be anywhere near him, not like normal times. And I had to get, I got 18 stitches tucked in the bloody back of my head. They did it in the dressing room. <laughs> Fred Allen says, they just lay you down there like sewing up a sheep. And he said, and if your ass twitched every time they stuck the needle. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. So, uh, in the finish, the dinner's sort of over and along comes. I'm sitting with Villapru and bloody 
Joe Musso and him. And it's just big shadows over the top of me, you know. And he's, he's going, hmm, oh, oh. <laughs> and what for? What for? What for? He's going, oh. I said, and I said, mm, you know, cut head and all that. I said, that's what for? That's what for? What you like? No, 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 no. Not me. It was plenty for. <laughs> See, I found out after the game was plenty for. Kicked me head in. So, uh, you know, well, I blame Fred Allen for that. No one else. That's Fred's fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the, even even though eighteen stitches, you're, you're in the ne test match the next week, which of course is Scotland, and you're you're a rather obvious man on the field. Oh, I was bandages. yeah, with a bandage on, and, and yeah, that was I got. It was a funny test. I, I got charged early on, with, you know, penalised, with over vigorous rucking, and that brought in a thing. If you get too Serious penalties, I suppose you call them. You get sent off. So I didn't. Know. It's like getting a yellow card now, I suppose. And so later in the game, I don't know. I was in the back of the Scotch ruck, and the ball was there, but I was getting shit kicked out of me. And so I helped the ball out for them, you know. And as the halfback got it, I sort of got his arm. And he didn't pass it properly. It went along the ground, you know, bouncy one. And I, the first five eight come across, picked it up, and I, I'm like that, and he kicked it straight into my stomach. And they somehow reckoned I'd kick the ball into him. So Laidlaw, their hooker, was the one. He comes out screaming out, "You dirty bar, the dirty bars because he flipped over this little half, first five eight. And the referee come and sent me off. And Hey, we've had many discussions about that with the river. He's a good guy, you know. He's still alive too to this day, and uh, he still thinks he was right, and I still think he was wrong. What was your immediate thought when it happened? But given when the, I'm, the, given when I'm walking off, I thought that's the end of my career. That's it. I'm finished. And you thought you'd been sent off as a tragedy. Representing your country and being sent off as curtains. Was that because of the reaction that happened with for Cyril Brownlee, or did you think, or? Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah. he had read about that, and uh, and uh, I, I don't know. But I just you, you, you think it's a tragic thing, and, and a lot of things happened after the game. You could, couldn't get into the dressing room, and some bloody pipe band fellas right out the back, they eh? weren't watching the game of rugby, they were drinking whiskey and a fella come in full. Are you hurting me boy? You're hurting? I said, no, no, I'm not hurt. He wouldn't go away, I nearly had to chase him away. I was just waiting for somebody to bring a key to the bloody dressing room. But, but a lot of stories come out of it. Hoppy tells the best one about how I should have limped. Well, I also understand that Charlie took the sending off pretty hard, particularly the, the treatment afterwards with the official panel that investigated well, it. Well, Charlie was tremendous, you know, and, uh, you know, big concession for them. They allowed me to ring the wife. <laughs> you get a free call. And, uh, you know, he, he put me through what was going to happen, kept me informed all the way, and the boys were good, you know. They were giving me assholes. Tremaine, we hopped off the plane at Cardiff and he threw a coat over me head and he said, that's the dirty bastard, that's the dirty one, that's the one you want to talk to. <laughs> you know, they're, they're great. But uh, the next day it was all, you've got to sit around and wait to see if we want you and I waited and waited and waited. Charlie never got there till about six o'clock, I think it was. And terribly upset. Yeah. Funny thing is it's turned out, I mean that became a sort of a talisman for the, the rest of your career and, and subsequent l life. Yeah, it was disappointing a young player gets sent off the other day and um, the first thing they say, along with Colin Meat and somebody else. But uh, Sonny Bill, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. It sort of, it didn't, Harm my career, put it that way. No, no. And and then of course after that is Wales, which was 
probably a, a, an unfortunate tour in its construction, wasn't it? Well, Wales, the tragedy with Wales was they come out here and thought they were going to win. They'd won the home nations, they'd won everything, and they put so much, because we never got together that like they do nowadays. They know the strength of each unit. But Wales, the strength of the British rugby couldn't have been strong. Wales won convincingly every game. What they weren't going to do, we're better than the Lions, we're better than this, and we, uh, Boyos will beat you, and, you know. So, uh, and they, they came out here thinking they were going to win, and that played into our hands. Of course, you had the marvellous first half in Christchurch in that test. Just, that was just about the epitome, I suppose, the high point of that whole era. Yeah, it, well, well, it was good in right here. Yeah. The Welsh also had an issue with Pat Murphy as referee, and particularly for the Jeff Young incident. What's your memories of that? Well, I think a lot of touring teams had uh, problems with Pat Murphy, but we in New Zealand loved him. And I always tell the story, and I've never really checked it out, but I think he had 17 or 18 tests, which was a lot in those days because, you know, they never refereed overseas, they just refereed at home and uh, he, um, he had his 17 tests and that sort of thing, but uh, and out of the 17 tests, 18 tests, we won 17. So I always say he was a bloody good referee. Yeah. But the Jeff Young thing was one of those things we, we'd started this game against Wales and they were super confident and we were having a willy away, as we used to call it, and it was uh, Ken Gray and I used to take turns at it after Wolfson had gone, you know. When Woolley was there, no one else did it. But, and, you know, it was always good when Ken did it, if you got outside him. And so I'd made a point of getting outside him from throwing to Lahore down to Gray. And, but before Gray catches it, this bloody Jeff Young swinging on him and pulling his jersey, and, you know, you're trying to swish him off and get rid of him. And, what happens, you knock the ball on or that sort of thing. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm right next to him and I think, mm. So a little while later, it's my turn, he did the same thing. And I said to him, hey, you do that again and I'll knock your bloody head off. And he didn't believe me, he didn't think I would or anything. So we're doing it again and he did it. And well, you know, the consequences and he, uh, he fell over and then got up and should have heard bloody Dawes and, you know, Gareth Edwards and all them. They're going crook as hell about number five, dirty, you know, and all that sort of thing. And Pat Murphy said, let us settle down, settle down. We've got a problem here. We've got this player on the ground. I saw it. I got it all under control. So he settled them down. Eventually, Jeff Young taken off, you know, gets carried away. He got up and fell over and got carried away. And they brought out another hooker and as soon as I got close enough to him, I said, I hope you got more brains than that last player. <laughs> and uh, we were there, but we get to start start the game again. And uh, Pat Murphy goes, penalty to the All Blacks. Well, you should have heard the Welshman going then. It was unreal. And he said, I told you I had it under control. First offence, he was offside, and he shouldn't be through there pulling jerseys, penalty of the all -man. So, because I'd said to Pat Murphy, if he does it, he does, it doesn't stop it, we will. So, but that was, it was sad, really, in many ways, but uh, that's life. Yeah. Also in the second test, of course, Fergie McCormick has his, his world record performance. What, what difference did Fergie make to the side when he came in? Well, Fergie sort of came in with Fred Allen, and Fred Allen made Fergie, because he liked the tough little bugger, and uh, Fergie was a tough little. So Fergie used to yell and shout and talk, get in there. And a uh, shocker to play against, because he'd be twiddling the opposition. You know, I can remember him playing against him in the North South. I said, get in here, this is where the men are you, and don't stand out there yelling. But I think Fred got Fergie the confidence, you know, like he picked him and he picked him ahead of Willamont, who was a great player, and uh, just give Fergie all that confidence and then playing him all the 
most of the time, number one fullback, and he was, uh, you know, just went from strength to strength. 1970, of course, you've got the, the long-awaited tour to, to South Africa, and uh, you were supremely fit and ready for it because you knew what was required. Brian's, of course, the captain, and you, you're looking like this was going to be the year that you were going to win that first series. Yeah, we thought so too. Uh, you know, we had a good forward pack, and uh, you know, some of the young ones it was Kirky and uh, uh, the other loose forward from South Canterbury, Tom, Tom, Lister. Tom Lister. Good players, you know, real good players, and putting pressure on the incumbents, you know, sort of thing. And you know, the going laid law. There, there was competition there in huge amounts, and. It was, you know, we got hit by injuries and then hit by referees. And, you know, Lahore got hurt before the tour even got going in, in Perth. And that led to an interesting captaincy moment for you with one of the sides. Well, I always used to, I was a superstitious guy and I always used to run out last. I don't know why it was a superstition, I'm either at the front or the back. And and when I was made vice captain, which was a silly call, I think, you know, having two in the forwards should have been McRae or somebody in the backs. And I, they said, you've got to run out second. And I thought about that. Eventually I did, and that's when I broke my arm. So never run out second again. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was a tour that, could have been one, but I think it got to us the length of it, and the, you know we never had the management insight to make us come together as a team. And some of our selections were struggling a bit, you know, sort of thing. And it ended up, I think, just about everyone got a test, and it was uh, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. Keith Murdoch, of course, was on that tour. It was your first experience of him, and I believe you had an early uh, well, I had example a big of his abilities. I had a big altercation with him in the trials before we went, and so we had to sort that. We sorted that out. But uh, Keith was a good player, and he should never have been sent home. And not that I was there. I'm not. I shouldn't speak about the occasion. But if he was sent home just for punching a security guard in the kitchen. I know a lot of worse things have happened with All Blacks on tours and never get sent home, so I don't, it was sad. But he was a good player and after our first altercation we got on well. Yeah, I, I believe you employed him as a bit of a lieutenant on the field. Oh Well, I, when you're captain you need some lieutenants and I was always win race lieutenant sort of thing. And I can never forget our first game that uh, it might have been our second game and I was captain. This team, we'd been there, you know, for eight or nine days, ten days, papers. They were away in a camp and they had no papers. They weren't allowed to read anything about the All Blacks. And I forget, we're playing out in the country somewhere. And, and uh, I went to Dan Westenhazen, I think. I think that was his name. You know, great big fellow. And Alec Vasey used to keep a list of where they all played and what their weights and heights were. Oh, I thought, what the hell is lock? I bet you I'm going to have to mark it. I went out, you know, to toss the coin and he wouldn't shake hands with me, wouldn't speak, wouldn't anything. I oh, bloody hell. Start to believe all these stories we're reading about them being in camp. And so I went back and got hold of the team and tried to tell them what it's like these buggers are bloody frothing at the mouth. And and um, I thought to myself, well, and I, I'm looking at it, and sure enough, I'm marking this Dan Weston Hosen, I think. He was a Springbok trialist. Toy Dan Hauser? Uh, you're getting close here. Yeah. Toy Dan Hauser. Oh, Dan Hauser. Yeah, yeah, that's him. So I thought, bloody hell, it'll be my. So I, I got old Murdoch in the corner, and he's sitting there, and I said, look, uh, this, this team of theirs, I might need a bit of help. Oh yeah, you know that's how we talk. <laughs> I said, don't you know that? Just if I give you the nod, you might have to just 
take him out from here and but you know settle him down because he's bloody frothing at me you know and that sort of thing and, but we'd been going 10 minutes and he wasn't any problem for me at all and he wasn't that good a line out forward so I didn't have to worry about it but we'd been going about this 10 minutes and all of a sudden this whack he'd hit this toy and I thought bloody hell what what the hell did you do that for they're all saying you know they got your number they'll be. oh he said I couldn't be bothered waiting for you <laughs> and so you know but like he sort of got a you know a bit of a rip. but he was he was a loyal all black and loyal over there loyal because it was first time marriage had been a loyal as hell to the the Maoris and uh, you know and New Zealand side of it and he, he was sad what happened to him. And Brian Williams of course came to light on that tour that must have been something of a revelation. Well Brian was the superstar he was the star of the 70 tour and, and only 19 I think he was when we left and just unbelievable ability and sidestepping on those hard rounds. He never played like that again. And, and I can remember halfway through the tour, I, we used to have rooming lists and, you know, to the start was Brian uh, Williams, you see, so old BG and you think, whoever was in charge, I think it was Ralph Colton, would have been in charge of the rooming list. Or whoever. I said, put me in a room with him. I want a room with him. I've got to get to know the bugger. He's so shy. Quite, you know, if there was old fellas around, he wouldn't come near you, you know, sort of thing. So I roomed with him and got to know him, but what a, what a great guy he's developed into and marvellous man for rugby. Yeah. And of course, Brian, that was Brian's last tour. I mean, you had a special relationship with him as well through the years. Oh, hell yeah, we, because King Country Wire Rapper used to play one another. Brian had had a broken a hand bone or something and he had to play some sort of some game it was against King Country at Owakuni <laughs> and he had to play this game to be in the test team you know that's how it was in those days if you don't not like now you six months and they put you straight in without a training run but, uh, but anyway so I, Brian and I worked it out on the phone I said well you, you we mark one another at the front of the line out it'll be all right I said, I've got a mad bugger at five, and you've got that big Rollins, I think his name was. We'll put the, let them go hammer and tongs, play them all the time. They can play five in the line out. So Brian and I, we'd get ourselves the odd line out here and there, and knew one another, played gentleman's rugby and everything, and he got picked. But no, we had a good relationship, and he was good. And you were very supportive of him when he became captain? Oh, hell yeah. and. and being such a good guy, but a lot of people, when the captaincy went from Winneray, you know, to a lot of people thought it's going to be Tremaine, it's going to be Ken Gray, Chris Laidlaw, Ian McRae, myself, quite a few. Like the last thing I wanted was that, but there was one or two others thought they might be captain. But Brian was, he, the way it turned out was a marvellous choice. And, uh, you know, we went and just, I went and saw him straight away and said, look, good, we'll support you, I don't worry about it. And if you need to got any problems, give us a yell, I'll fix them up for you. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, after after South Africa and the, and the disappointment there, it's the Lions, and, and they they regarded as their greatest team, but um, you were going through a rebuilding phase, of course. Well, after South Africa, we had a lot of, it was different in those days, it was an amateur game, and after South Africa, we had a hell of a lot retire you know that had the big tour you know the big tours were either go to the British Isles and South Africa and if you'd done them your rugby career was sort of you know a lot of them thought it was over and, and so a lot of our top players had retired and uh, we you know a lot of new selections and that sort of thing and and I don't think it was the best selected side ever and uh, we just needed a I don't know what we needed, a bit, a bit more skills. And deep down they should have made, shouldn't have made me captain and they should have had Kirky or somebody like that captain. And of course Kirky had come on the scene in 67, hadn't he? Yeah, he'd been around a little while and he'd captained the South Island team a couple of times. 
and a good everyone would have followed him. And, and of course, he scored the significant try with a bit of assistance from yourself in the in the second. Well, I gave it to him out of the ruck. I still tell him that, and he doesn't believe me. But uh, but they were a, they were a great team, the Lions, weren't they that year? They had well, some they great were, players. They were good in the right places, and yeah. uh, they they planned their tour well. Uh, Carwin James was an astute guy. Like Sid going and get penalised three or four times a game for putting the ball in crooked. It was all through Carwin James. And I don't know how they kept the same referee for four tests. And Jack Sullivan assured me after the second one he won't get any more. And up they'd come again. But that was life and we should have been bigger than what we were to combat it. And that, of course, was to be your, the end of your career. Was there a temptation to carry on? I mean, there's a lot of people have said you should have been on the 72, 73 tour. Oh, well, I had a tragic accident in 70, at the end of 71 in December. And I never started playing until about June. You know, club and king country and that sort of thing. And tragic accident? You broke your back, did you? Yeah, oh, cracked three or four vertebrae, that's all. But it was... It, it made me think, and I, I'm a of a you know, a great friend, but he was the chairman of selectors, and and like Pat Walsh, who's the same age as me, and who I played with, and and Bob Duff, they were selectors, but and the message I'd got that Bob Duff thought I'd be too strong and try and take over, you know, and there was doubts, and Vadonovich said to me. We'll guarantee you an All Black. I'll guarantee you an All Black trial, but I can't guarantee you'll get picked. So I thought about it for a while and probably discussed it with Vern. I don't know whether I did, but uh, probably did and just said, no, nah, time to pull the pin. It was, it's the end of, a, of an era. Was it a difficult decision to make? Oh, hell yeah, and you started playing relaxed rugby for King Country, you know, you're not playing against great sides and yeah. you can play pretty well in some of those games and and you know there was a lot of talk afterwards what would have happened and wouldn't have happened if I'd have gone but it was the start of the, the young brigade of uh, Brian Williams spoke about it down here at a function a couple of weeks ago, the, the sombreros and the long hair and the and he even said if Colin Mead was there, they wouldn't have been wearing those sombreros. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it was the start of a different, you know, yeah. young ones coming through and being a bit more aggressive and management not quite as strong. Uh, it was also the start of a new role for you as a sort of a, a man who put his name to good use for public service. Well, it, that, that happened in funny ways too, you know, you do these things and I'd made a comment, you know, that after I'm not available that I was still going to play for two years, you know, club and provincial. And then they had these presidents, 15s and those sort of things and, you know, you're not really in the condition to be, you know, a bit different to playing or that sort of rugby. But we played them and had a great time and actually won one game. And and then I, you know, virtually said, that's it. I, at the end of that, uh, you know, at one stage I said, no rugby for two years. So I just give everything away from rugby and uh, then see what happens. And the charming people from the IHC come and visited me and said, uh, we're setting up a new branch here in the King Country, it all used to be part of South Auckland and we're setting up branches here, there and everywhere. We want you to be chairman of the King Country IHC. I, I swore at them and told them I knew nothing about it. And to cut a long story short, over after a cup of tea, I was chairman of the King Country IHC branch. And so it started up a, something for you to think about, you know, the hardships of other people and then amongst them you made friends you know some of them and I often used to go to a function they have one or two in Hamilton where they bring them all together from Tamaranui to Pukekohe they have a dance and a ball and they all get these handicapped and a few drink 
drinks on board and all that sort of thing. I said to the wife, three quarters of the way through one now, tell me which ones are handicapped and which ones aren't. <laughs> you know, but they, yeah, I, I enjoyed it there for a while and it was a demanding thing on, you know, going to Parliament and visiting politicians, and which is not column eight, really. You can't sit there and say, give us this or that. But fellows like the Jim Bolgers and them were good. And so I got put me in different places amongst different people and taught me how to run a meeting properly and all those things. One person we haven't mentioned, of course, is your brother Stan. That must have been great to go through so much rugby together. Yeah, it was, and Stan was a great athlete. You know, people don't realise what a great player he was. And he, he was the one guy that used to upset me more than anyone else. I could never beat him at training. Is that right? He, he, was, that, he was the quickest forward we had in the All Blacks. He could give me 100 yards in the length, uh, 10 yards the length of the bloody field but he annoyed me. <laughs> and all our training runs we used to run together like, and so we had a big hill going up to the house at home. And if I'd, I'd take off and try and be, you know, might be 10 yards in front of him, he'd clean me up on that bloody hill going home every time. Mm. But uh, no, he was great assistant, and I think I, my rugby went off when he, I don't know that it did, but when he retired, it, it made it, a little bit harder for me because we'd split the farm up and you know had your own jobs to do. Just looking back and you know, I mean what what is rugby I mean it's obviously been a huge part of your life but do, do you sit back and sort of pinch yourself and think well that was just you know fantastic? When you go down and look at this I don't know who put it up me daughters and the local council you look at that and you think hell's teeth it brings up things you remember, broken arms and all those sort of things. That, uh, it, it makes you proud in many ways of what you've achieved, but it also, the ones you missed out on, like not beating South Africa over there to me was always bloody upsetting.